to share a song um, called Anchored that I wrote over the summer um, when I was spending some time in Psalm 16. So I wanted to read a little bit of that to you. It says, Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life and you will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. So during this time of a lot of uncertainty, we can rest assured that we are secure. We are anchored in the faithfulness of a mighty, mighty God. Secure 
anchored in the faithfulness of my mighty Lord. Anchored in the faithfulness of my mighty Lord. Oh, I'm anchored in the faithfulness of my mighty Lord. Anchored in the faithfulness of my Good evening, my name is Kay Warhite. It's my privilege to be here. I serve in the Butler campus. And before I begin tonight's devotional, I just want to remind you that you can go to InChat. If you have a prayer request, you would like to have someone talk with you, we have Orchard Hill staff standing by. Or you can go to Orchard Hill Church online uh, just to find someone. If not, uh, now you can do it when we're done. This evening, I get to the privilege of sharing Psalm 14. This is called a lament, and that's not necessarily something we want to hear. But as with all verses in the Bible, there are many ways that we can identify with this psalm. The psalm, if, if you don't mind, I'll read the whole thing first. It's, the Lord has said in his heart, there's no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There's no one who does good. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside together. They have become corrupt. There's no one who does good, not even one. Do all the workers of wickedness not know who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great dread, for God is with a righteous generation. You would put to shame the counsel of the afflicted, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores his captive people, Jacob will rejoice. Israel will be glad. Okay, so what was that all about? First of all, the first uh, verse, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They're corrupt. They've committed abominable deeds. There's no one who does good. A fool is not someone who's an atheist. A fool is someone who believes in God, but he believes in his heart. He says in his heart, there is no God. In other words, a fool is a person who wants to do their own thing or wants to follow other people, even though they believe there's a God. Um, I think in Isaiah, it says, well, I know in Isaiah, it says 32, 47, a fool is one who practices ungodliness. So how are we foolish? We're foolish when we say, I read the Bible, I go to the Orchard Hill devotional on in the evening, I pray with other people, but in my heart, I think there might be other people who could tell me better than God what needs to be done. And we turn to other people rather than God. Now, a uh, very small example of this, when my husband and I were first married, um, remember the day when you would go to a store in a small town and the same people were there forever and they knew all the merchandise, you could trust the clerk. Well, then the big box stores came to town and my husband and I would go to the store and he would know what he needed is wood or pipes or whatever. And I would always say, let's just ask a clerk. And it got to be a joke between us because he would say, how do you know they weren't just hired an hour ago? I was believing in my husband, but I think I thought maybe other people might know more. This is what a fool is, as described in the Bible and Psalms. Someone who says, I believe in God, but in my heart, I'm going to trust other people. And this is kind of what we're doing uh, with the coronavirus and the news, trying to look for other people for answers. The second verse, the Lord looks down from heaven on the sons of men. That means he knows each generation, not just those of the Bible times, but the children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Why does he look down? To see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. So he does see us even though we think that God is gone or absent and he hurts with us. And again, for what is he looking? To see if there are any who understand or any who seek him. So we have questions. Where are you, God? Why don't you stop this? Will you make yourself known to me and to others right now? How can I see you in this? When will we see you? And will you provide a fill in the blank for us? These are the questions we have. So is it wrong to question God? Tim Keller says, um, if you want God, take heart. 
It's because he wants you to find him. In other words, when you think about it, God gives us the questions. Otherwise, we would be dull and just accept what's happening. But instead of taking those questions and asking God and turning away, being full-ish, looking to other people, God is wanting us to find him in the midst of this, to come to him. It says in the Bible, when you search for me, you will find me when? When you search for me with all your heart. Not a flippant along with others. Where's God when this is going on? But a real hunger and thirst to know, God, what do you want from us during this time? You know, I have a self-diagnosed racing mind. It's hard for me if someone has a British accent or they have uh, hair out of control or a plaid shirt with striped pants, I can't get past. I can't hear what they're saying. And oftentimes this is how we read the Bible. We get distracted very easily. We have racing minds. We read the word, but we can't quite get into what God is saying to us. So how do we do that? We ask God with the Holy Spirit, please help me to read this word. We do it through the word, through the spirit and through others. We have friends and things like evening devotionals, online chats, reaching out. But it's up to us to ask God, help me to be focused and to see you in this in this time. And it says in verse three, they've all turned aside together. They've become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. What does it mean to turn aside? We look to God and then we turn aside and look to the stock market. We look to God and then we go and we hoard some more. We turn to MSNBC, we turn to Fox News, we turn to the internet, we turn to Facebook, we turn to online chats, we turn away from God. Not one of us. So to feel guilty and say it's just me, all of us are like that. We all turn. One time I was lamenting to my husband about how fickle I am, how, how easily I can turn from God. And my husband said, don't you think God knows how hard it is to be a human being? How easy it is for us to turn away. And what does God want from us? Well, he says in verse four, which is prophecy, will evildoers never learn those who devour my people as men eat bread. Think about going through the drive through without even turning to the Lord. We shove the food in. There are men who devour, want to eat up. There is no God. Or why are you turning to God? Or these are the facts. This is what you should be doing. It says they are in great dread. At one point, those people that we turn to also have fears. Am I supposed to have the answers? Who do they turn to? For God is with the righteous generation. He will put to shame the counsel of the afflicted, afflicted but the Lord is our refuge. So what is a refuge? A refuge is a shelter, our home, the place we're supposed to be with God. Um, it is a place of comfort. And that sounds like a little Pollyannish, like I'll just go to God and he'll comfort me. But that's what God wants to do. He wants us to turn away from the things of this world and turn to him. It says in the Bible, he is our refuge. And that might be an attribute that we need to claim and give to him. There are those who wouldn't think of praying or those who ridicule those who do pray, but it's up to us to keep our eyes, to stay focused on the Lord. The Lord restores his captive people. If we have turned away, he will bring us back to him. He will restore us as he did those Israelites. He brought them back for salvation. And it's not a temporary, he's going to save us, but an eternal salvation. The other day I was in the grocery store and the shelves were empty. The meat department was closed. There was a limit on bread um, and milk. But when I turned the corner and I saw something, I started to cry. And it had nothing to do with the store. I saw a young adult woman, Down syndrome, with her mother. And everywhere her mother looked, this woman looked into her mother's face. Her assurance was her mother's face. And when her mother looked up, she looked up. And when her mother looked down in the cart, the woman followed. The reason I cried was it re I realized this is the image that God wants us to have with him, to look into his face innocently, not to others, not to try and find other ways, but to look to God as children. You know, we're, talked, we're being told to wash our hands and scrub them, but this time I'm gonna ask you to be like a child, fold your hands, Put them together as a child and bow your heads. And I will pray Psalm 139, 23, 
and 24 to close. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious, foolish thoughts and see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.